Hey team, Coach Hay here, and welcome to Unit 4. So we're going to start things off with Unit 4, Day 1, What is Colonization? Before we can discuss the age of colonialism, we have to discuss what is colonization. So your objective for today is, after reading scholarly analysis, Western civilization's legacy has a dark side, Learners will be able to determine the meaning of academic texts and compare sources through four text-based questions, scoring 66% after revision, RH 910.4.6. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. So our guiding questions for today, how is colonialism related to climate change? How would you summarize the effects of Europeans on the Americas? And how would you describe the sequence of events that led to colonialism? The I can statements for the day is I can determine the meaning of academic vocabulary. I can compare sources. I can identify the concepts behind colonialism. Like I said, everybody, this is the first day of our new unit, Unit 4, Age of Colonization. Here is your annotation guide. If you still are unsure about how to annotate, there should be a link right here to the other video. Please read these by yourself. And let's start. So first things first, what is colonization? Well, colonization is a large-scale population movement where the migrants maintain a strong link with their or their ancestors' former country gaining significant privileges over others inhabitants of the territory by such links. So, using our do now example of aliens, simply put, what is colonization? It is when the aliens take over and they put their people in charge. And by being in charge, the native population, the humans, would be subjugated. So, we're going to take it out of the alien metaphor and put this into reality because we're trading in the starships for boats. Because the age of modern colonialism began in the 15, late 15th century, following the European discovery of various sea routes. So you have to remember, at this time, we have no semis, no tractor trailers, there's no trains to transport heavy goods. If you need to transport something, you have two ways. You could put it on a beast of burden, like an ox or a camel, and that takes forever and is expensive. Or you could put it on a ship, which comparatively is pretty cheap because a ship can carry lots of stuff. So Vasco da Gama discovers that Africa has a southern coast. Remember, we know because we have planes and satellites and stuff that there is a sphere that the oceans surround all of our continents. They didn't really know that at this time. They had their inclinations. They had used their mathematical formulas. But for the most part, if a land kept going, they just assumed it went on forever. Bosco da Gama discovers that if he shoots around the what would be known as the Cape of Good Hope, and he keeps trucking up the European or the European African coast, shoots the gap between Madagascar and Mozambique, and keeps going quite a spell, he's going to end up in Persia. And now there is a sea passage. So the Silk Road was absolute game changer, getting things across. But that was by cart. That is slow. Now they can move it by ship. And colonization will absolutely take hold. We know that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and columbus with money from the spaniards tries to find a sea route kind of aping da gama to india he ends up in hispaniola modern day dominican republic and haiti things go very poorly for the people who already live there and magellan finds his way to the Americas and scoots around what is now known as the Strait of Magellan, which goes around modern day Peru. And in 1520, there was a sea route around every continent. So with these events, the power shifts from the Mediterranean Sea 
to the Atlantic Maritime Powers. So traditionally, we have gone over the Mediterranean Powers. The mighty Mediterranean Sea, as can be seen here, was essentially an ocean to the ancient peoples. The most powerful nations of the African Eurasian mega continent can all be found right here. We have in Africa the Moors, then the Berbers, the Persians, the Ottomans, the Greeks, the Romans, the French, Spanish. Now, with this new sea route, it is going to enable the Atlantic powers that will not have to move through the mighty rock of Gibraltar to take center stage. Colonies of antiquity. So the first colonies we know of are of the Egyptians. Now, there is a dichotomy between expansion and colonization. When it comes to expansion, that is where you take over your neighbors, and it just goms in to one big area. Versus colonization, further away, and the population and land is looked at as a resource. So the people and the land and the resources are all looked at as simply resources for the mother country. This was practiced by the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, and the Phoenicians. Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself, Coach Hay. This sounds a lot like a vassal state, which we went over in Unit 2, Day 3. Well, they have similarities, but they really differ quite a bit. That's why I made this fun Venn diagram. So, a vassal state. You get to keep your same ruler, largely get to keep your local customs, and to the average peasant, there's going to be little change. So if you're a pig farmer, you're just sitting there, and you normally give your tribute to your landowner, who gives it to the nobles, who gives it to the government, or is the government in that case, and your life doesn't change. You're just a pig farmer. Then, the colony. The colonists will appoint their own rulers. The laws will reflect the will of the colonizers, and colonizing culture will be impressed on the peasants. So, versus the vassal state, you are going to notice that your rulers are no longer there. Your laws that you have come accustomed to are gone. And all of a sudden, people are making you, the pig, humble pig farmer, speak a different language, dress a certain way, and more than likely, worship a different god. Now, they're similar, though, in the way that goods and taxes are sent to the overlord state. So, either way, the overlord state gets paid. And either way, the occupied citizens must militarily support the overlord country. So, whether it is a vassal state or a colony, Remember how the feudal structure is set up. Here's your peasants. Here is your landowners. If there is an aristocracy above them, and then your king. So when the king says, hey, nobles, we need this stuff, the landowners then call upon their peasants to be the soldiers. In some circumstances, we're not going to get into it. Simply put, you're going to send troops away. Troops, goods, and taxes are all things that are sent in either a vassal state or a colony. But the main key is whether you get to still be you or you are now a colony. So, second thing. Again, we're parsing a lot because this is a six-day unit, and we want to make sure that we have all of our nomenclature down. Imperialism versus colonialism. This comes down to the idea versus the practice. So what is imperialism? A policy or ideology of extending the rule over peoples in other countries for extending political and economic access, power, and control, often through employing hard power and especially military force. What could be soft power? So imperialism states, might makes right. If you are a big, strong country, you have the ability, and if not, the duty to take over smaller places that will be better for you, big, mighty country. 
You may use hard power, which is military. You send troops, you take over. Or soft power. If you are a big, rich country, you may look at a very small and poor country and say, listen, do what we say, or we're not going to trade with you and you will starve. That is the ideology. The practice is colonialism, the control by one power over a dependent area or people. It occurs when one nation subjugates another, conquering its population, exploiting it, often while forcing its own language and cultural values upon its people. So we see here imperialism, the ideology, colonialism, the actual brass tacks, boots on the ground, subjugation. So why would they do this? Well, the world is pretty colonized in our heads because you probably think this top map is correct. Now, I guess in fairness, there is some non-malevolent forces to having Europe be bigger than it actually is, mostly because semi-important nations like Denmark and Switzerland are actually quite tiny. So by blowing up the map and making all the continents seem a little bit more equal in size, you can fit all the countries without kind of having to do any sort of, uh, you know, what have you, versus how it actually is. This map isn't perfect, but it's closer. Africa's huge. It can fit North America and Europe just in itself. Europe is tiny. And the key is we look at the, no the quote unquote normal map, the incorrect map. And in our minds, if we got in a boat going from the port of Newark all the way across just in a straight line, we would end up somewhere in England. But in all actuality, we would end up at the southern tip of Portugal, if not southern Spain. And if you did that from Florida, you would end up somewhere in Morocco because the climate of those are more similar to our own versus England, Ireland, the Nordic countries. They are cold. Especially in England and Ireland, it is cold and rainy. Everything is very seasonal. It is very difficult to survive the harsh, harsh winters. So they, like a New Jersey old couple trying to get to Florida, decide they're going to go someplace warm. And the nautical technologies that spread through the Silk Road gave them the ability to do it. And here's the big one. Here's the big one, everybody the three G's. This is huge. If you learn anything from this course, it should be right here. This will be an essay question. The three G's are God, glory, and gold. God, of course, they want to spread the word of their prophets. Universally, they want to spread the word of God. The Catholic religion was very in imperative to this, and we will cover it in a later lesson in this unit. Glory. Well, I think you can understand this one, because the search for glory is a very human idea. See, at this time, in order to be scrolled in the annals of history, you had to do something magnificent. Versus today, everybody's trying to just, well, go viral and get the clicks. See, they judge their glory by gold, which I guess we do too, and probably to the end of time. And when humans, the last humans will, on earth, will unequivocally measure their standing on gold. So God, glory, and gold. They wanted to spread the word of God. They wanted to advance their personal and national glory and of course it's all about the benjamins well i guess golden benjamins sacagaweas all right that one got away from me but gold and i always hammer the geography thing and trust me over the next six lessons you are going to get hammered with geography stuff but let's never forget about environmental. 
because what is bad for the environment? Generally people, people are pretty bad for the environment. So by definition, colonization is introducing foreign art organisms into a native environment. I wish you had showed up to class because you could have seen how I brought this all the way around to do with aliens, but that is just a special privilege for all the kids who are actually in class today. Um, but the colonizers also brought invasive species with them. They wanted the place to look the same. They said, okay, well, here are the things that we grow back home. We'll grow them there, except so in the better soil, it will work better. But the key is they did not think, I guess they didn't know about invasive species that they would take over, especially black rats. These are the pizza rat, big daddy monster rats. You don't want to mess with. They brought them here. Although there were rats and mice here, not like these. Also, weeds like crabgrass and most of all, disease. Disease was the largest killer. It was not a gun nor a blade. It was disease that wiped out the First Nations people of the Americas. The indigenous population had not lived through the Great Plagues. Again, we've talked about this. The Silk Road connected Europe with Asia. The Royal Road primarily connected the Middle East to Europe. All of Europe, Asia, and Africa, to most part, were connected at this time. So the bubonic plague spread almost everywhere. The people who did not experience it, well, they were still in the Americas. And that's the hardest part about disease, where once you're immune to something, you can still be a carrier of it and not know it because you're immune. But someone who is not immune can catch it off of you, and it can be devastating. Like 55 million people devastating. Scientists estimate that's how many people were killed in colonization. And modern scientists are kicking around the idea that this was a contributor to the European Little Ice Age, not just Genghis Khan. So this is an activity that we will be doing. See that in Google Classroom. And finally, we're at the independent practice. So as always, we do have a article to do. You can, it is available in English and Spanish. You have to annotate and do the quiz. You'll get three points for every correct quiz answer, and you'll get two points for every correct annotation. So if you highlighted all the points of bias, highlighted where you got all the information, highlighted all the key terms, and you asked me a question, you're gonna get eight points right there, and then however many questions you get correct. All right, guys, that's unit four, day one. For Coach Hay, be smart, be safe, and I'll see you next time. Later.